Welcome to another in the mail. If you're new to the channel, I should mention that this is the most popular type of video I publish on my channel. I guess many people agree that it's exciting to find new tools and gadgets that we can use to equip our hobby workshops. And before I get this started, I wanted to quickly mention that I recently got into prepping coffee at home and I got a really nice espresso machine and there is a lot that I'm learning in the process, stuff that I would like to share with you guys because I think coffee is the engineer's fuel. It's likely that many of my viewers drink coffee and are thinking into making their own at home. So what do you think? Should I create a secondary channel where I share my coffee adventures? Let me know in the comments below because there's likely a lot of stuff that I'm purchasing for that hobby and I'm testing it and maybe you'd like to hear my thoughts on all of this. I'm gonna get this mailbag started with a, a few development boards and lately I've been playing with some projects that require an ESP32C3 and I did not have any dev boards for that particular module from Espressive. So I started by getting this guy from Olimax because they are in Bulgaria very close to me and they shipped this thing the same day and within two or three days it was at my door via local courier. It's a very basic ESP32 uh, C3 uh, dev module uh, but has all of the required basic stuff that I like. It's got USB-C, it's got some status LEDs, a single cell LiPo charging circuit and the GPIO broken out to this 0.1 inch header. It sells for 6 euros which is not bad considering that it's made in the EU. And this thing will get you up and running on the ESP32 C3 in no time and it comes with great uh, documentation. The USB-C connector does not go through a USB to serial converter like you might be used to. Instead, it connects uh, directly to the ESP32 C3 USB interface. And if you're not familiar with the uh, C3 module from Espressive, you might ask yourself how is this different from the standard ESP32 modules? Um, well, uh, physically it's a little smaller and the short answer is that the CPU inside of this module is based on a RISC-V architecture. It's got Bluetooth 5.0, but mostly for the average user, these things are not visible. You just program it the same way you did before. Next, I also got this little guy from AliExpress, again based on the ESP32C3 mini module. And it comes with two USB-C ports. One of them goes through a USB to serial adapter chip and the other one connects directly to the uh, USB interface on the module. And I believe this is a copy of some official uh, dev board from Espressive. There is also an RGB LED, so you could play with that to bring up some code on this dev board. And again, you have uh, all of the GPIO broken out to a 0.1 inch header, which is very, very convenient. And having those two USB-C ports is also uh, pretty nice because you can run some USB host application on one of the ports while maintaining a serial connection via the other port. And now, even though this board costs under $5 shipped from AliExpress, shipping to Romania has gone up considerably over the past couple of years. Uh, there was also the VAT collection thing that they introduced, so I can't really get shipping costs under $3. But on the bright side, service has improved a lot because they, they now group the orders, send them packaged together to some warehouse in Hungary, which then forwards it via local courier to my address. So it's much faster and more reliable. And I must say that I've had close to zero packages lost in the past year since they've started doing this type of service. But I would also be interested in hearing your experience uh, in the past year with AliExpress shipping to other EU countries. Let me know in the comments below. Next up, I have my third ESP32C3 dev board. This one is called ESP32C3 Super Mini and it has a USB-C port connected directly to the uh, ESP module uh, but it's uh, built into this super compact form factor and I think this can be really useful when you plan to pack this into a, a very tight space. You don't get all of the uh, GPIO broken out uh, on the pin headers as you get with the other dev modules. Uh, you don't get much more than uh, a power and the user controllable LED but when you really need the space savings, this makes a lot of sense, so do check it out. I'll be placing links in the description below to all of these products. And the previous two modules were using the ESP uh, C3 Mini 
a module from Espressive, which includes a PCB antenna on the module. Well, for this one, they're using the uh, chip directly on the PCB and they've added a small surface mount 2.4 gigahertz antenna, which uh, takes up uh, less space on the PCB. Next up, I have some very non-interesting dev board that you all might already be familiar with. This is the Wemos D1 Mini, but it should be version 4.0. And I really have no idea what that means, but I do know it's based on the ESP8266 chip and it's upgraded to use a USB Type-C port instead of the old micro USB. This is a pretty outdated chip for these days, which costs the same as an ESP32 dev board, but comes with less features. However, you might find yourself in a position like I did, where I was trying to use this old firmware published on GitHub on like six years ago, and it was built to run on ESP8266. Now I'm, I'm not a firmware guy, so instead of wasting time uh, trying to get that to run on a newer ESP32, I prefer to buy the older dev board and flash it uh, on what it was supposed to run on. So that was my motivation for getting this uh, dev board. Uh, I don't have any other reason why I would want to use an ESP8266 these days. But if you happen to be interested in this, you should get this newer revision, which comes with USB-C, and I will link this in the description below so you can check it out. Next up, I got some of this uh, braided heat shrink cable sleeve and it's got this thick braided sleeving look. It has a shrink ratio of two to one and it really does uh, shrink even though it looks like plastic, but um, I've tested it. Now, if you want this more professional braided sleeving finish, this will get the job done. But here are a couple of things to be aware of uh, before you start using it. This stuff is more expensive. It's not a fortune, but still considerably more expensive than the standard heat shrink tubing. Next, this stuff is thicker than the standard tube, so expect to get a stiffer and thicker final assembly. You should also be careful when applying heat. Don't go full blast as it might melt this completely and wrinkle it. And I tested with my hot air station at 200 degrees. Seems to be working nice. It slowly uh, heats up and, and shrinks it. And finally, there is a visible seam where the tube has been joined, so you have to take all of this into consideration if you plan to use this uh, different heat shrink braided sleeve. It does look nice and professional once it's done, so uh, it's well worth considering for your next wiring project. And while we are in the wiring department, I also got a couple of these big 30 millimeter rubber grommets, which can help with uh, sealing any entry into an electrical box. It's it won't be as tight of a seal as one of the proper ga cable glands that uh, just uh, tighten around your cable, but might be good enough for most applications and you get the advantage of uh, easily inserting or removing additional cables when you use one of these. And for a uh, similar purpose, I got the uh, simpler uh, snap-on rubber grommets, which are typically used to protect the wire going through a panel, such as not to let the wire rub against a uh, sharp panel edge. And you can find these in a variety of uh, sizes. These ones are 15 millimeter in diameter. Next up, I have a very interesting item, which is advertised as a pet positioning GPS locator. The model number on this is a GF. 07 and this thing is scary small. Now here are a couple of interesting specs which kind of contradict the product naming. Uh, the GPS positioning accuracy is advertised as 500 meters which makes me think it's only doing assisted GPS based on the GSM network and it's not actually using a uh, GPS module inside. As far as connectivity, uh, this thing will only work with older 2G GSM network technology. It will not connect to 3G, 4G or 5G networks. And the internal battery is rated for 400 milliamp hours and the battery life coated as 200 hours, which I find hard to believe. Maybe standby time, but uh, here is where things get interesting. This thing uh, does have a microphone inside. And if you call the number on the SIM card you insert into this, it will um, answer the call and you can listen in on the conversation, which by the way, I hope I don't have to tell you, but it's illegal in most places around the globe. So it's not so much of a tracker 
I mean, it can give you a rough location within maybe a one kilometer radius or better, but mostly gives you the ability to listen in by calling the module. The uh, small user manual they include is uh, pretty much hopeless. You can barely understand a thing from the uh, Chinglish they used here. And also important to note for any of the tracking options, you would have to sign up on this Chinese portal and obviously upload the data to Chinese servers. So I'm only showing this thing here as a proof of concept. It's an interesting piece of hardware, uh, but be careful how you use it. Next up, I have an interesting hand wave sensor that works with 12 to 24 volts input and this will generally be used to turning on or off some low voltage DC power lighting like some LED tape but it's not necessarily restricted to that. It's very simple to use because you have a power input where you supply it with 12 to 24 volts and then you get a power output which is activated when you wave your hand in front of the sensor. So you can imagine having this integrated into your kitchen cabinet and turning off your lights at the kitchen counter without actually having to physically touch a switch. And while I explain more about the different variants of this sensor, I will be hooking it up to power to show you how it works. So if we look at the product page on AliExpress, we'll notice there are four different variants. There is a touch switch, there is the hand wave, there is a PIR, and there is something like proximity switching, which also uses IR like the hand wave. Now these switches are part of a system, so they do come with uh, the specific cabling and connectors that uh, likely can plug into other accessories that this seller will offer. The power rating is 60 watts on 12 volts and 100 watts on 24 volts and if you keep your hand still in front of the sensor, I'm guessing very close to it, it should work as a dimmer which is pretty neat. And the switch comes with its own uh, little mount included in the package and uh, as you can observe here it really does work as advertised and it feels pretty nicely built. It's also fairly modular because I can for example unplug the switch itself and plug a different type of switch and the cost of this thing isn't bad either so I can highly recommend trying this out and as usual the link is in the description below. My next product is part of pretty much the same product category home improvement furniture lighting accessories and this is like a touch proximity switch that you can embed behind a wood panel of up to 25 millimeter in thickness. Now luckily the standard modern furniture panel thickness is roughly 18 to 20 millimeters in thickness so this should work pretty well if it meets the advertised working distance. And this product comes as both black and white although I'm not sure why it would matter since you're embedding it anyway and it comes in two wiring options. You can get it with DC jacks or this form of uh, DuPont uh, wire connectors. I'm guessing 2.5 millimeter pitch and this is to make it plug and play with some types of LED tapes I'm guessing. It can do 12 to 24 volt DC up to 60 watts power capability and again while I'm presenting this I'm also wiring it up to a power supply and LED tape so we can check it out. It should have the same dimming behavior on a long touch same as the previously shown switch but additionally this product presentation shows that it can maybe do some kind of sweep motion sensing and if you find that the sensitivity is not so great you can also partially mill out a hole in your wood panel to bring the sensor closer to the surface to the sensing area. So it does seem to work. Let's see if it dims the LEDs by uh, holding my hand here. Yep, it does. So it does it in the up direction and then you need to remove your hand, place it again to do it in the down direction. And let's see if this thing also works through this uh, thick, like two centimeters thick uh, cardboard box. Okay, so it, it does work. Let's see if we can dim it. Yep, it does dim the LEDs. So it does work through a uh, two centimeters or maybe even thicker, 25 millimeter thick cardboard box. So I'm guessing it should also work through a wood panel. My next item is also LED tape related. This is a product from a company called uh, Gled Opto, which I've seen has become pretty popular lately for home automation type uh, gadgets and modules. And that is because they use ESP modules in their products, which makes them compatible with open source firmware platforms like Tasmota, WLED or ESP Home. So this particular product is an LED controller which features an ESP8266 module with four megabytes of flash memory 
which is not ideal for WLED or generally driving LED tapes uh, because of the SP8266 module, but I'll come back to that topic in a second. This thing is capable of uh, taking a 5 to 24 volt DC input and it can drive up to 10 amp max up to 800 addressable LEDs such as WS2812, SK6812 and, and others. So it's specifically tailored to drive digital uh, strip uh, LEDs. And what uh, do I mean by this not being ideal with the ESP8266? Well, it doesn't apply to this particular model, but uh, I really want to mention this so that you're aware of it. Um, the ESP8266 does not support hardware PWM, which are these physical counters arranged in a physical PWM peripheral inside the hardware, like the ESP32 ha has. So it, the ESP8266 does this through software emulation by toggling pins based on various software timers. And the effect of this is that when the ESP8266 is busy doing other tasks like uh, the ones that have higher priority, like servicing the Wi-Fi or any other higher priority tasks, that timing will vary. So you will get flickering on your PWM. But driving a digital LED tape, which doesn't need an external PWM signal coming from the driver module, uh, this won't, will not be a problem. Uh, and this is what I plan to use this for. So I can just flash this with WLED, Task Mode, ESP Home or whatever, and I can connect some LED tape and control it from Home Assistant, which is pretty neat. A link to this will be provided in the description below. My next item is a replacement Apple Watch charger. And why did I get this uh, cheap clone? Uh, you might ask, instead of the original, well, the original Apple charger is something like $37 plus shipping here in Romania. And I only need the second charger for the occasional charge at the office um, whenever I forget to charge at home. It's not worth paying $37 for that when I can get something like this for $5, which is seven times cheaper, comes with this USB Type-C port, it's very small and will do a similar job. And for being used two or three times a year when I forget to charge at home, I would argue this is a far better deal. What do you think? And here's this uh, thing in action. There's no annoying LED or anything like that on the charger and it charges at approximately 1 watt but that is of course also depend on the fact that my watch almost has a, uh, a full battery so I don't think it's pulling too much from the charger. And the last item in today's video is this stainless steel scrub cleaner which is supposedly made out of stainless steel rings and you would use something like this to clean maybe a cast iron pan where it's not recommended to use uh, any aggressive detergent cleaning because you would remove the protective seasoning in the process. So you would instead just scrub the leftovers with such a steel scrub. And I wanted to show this even though it's not tech related because I think uh, this may uh, have other cleaning purposes in the workshop. So you might be interested in getting something like this as well. I'm not 100% convinced this is actually made out of stainless steel. I guess time will tell uh, if this will rust or not, but it was very cheap, so I'm not going to regret the purchase. Same as always, you'll find links for all of these items in the description below. And that was all for today. I hope you found something interesting to order. If you did, let me know in the comments and I will catch you next time.